So I'd like to thank you all for attending today. I hope uh, everybody's been staying uh, well and relatively sane these days. Uh, as a public research university, UMBC's approach to cybersecurity is aligned um, by the philosophy of our cybersecurity center around four broad thrusts, education, research, entrepreneurship, and partnership. And partnership really underscores the other three, and it enables us to bring you talks like this, where we are partnering and collaborating with fellow academics and researchers and people from industry to share their insights and wisdom in our distinguished lecture series, of which this is the spring 2021 distinguished lecture. As far as the flow of today's talk, um, after the speaker introductions, um, we'll have the speaker's presentation. If you have questions during this time, please um, put it in the chat. I will triage questions at the end and, uh, and, and relay them to our, um, to, to our guest. Please mute yourself or be muted by me as the, uh, the host. With that, um, our speaker today is Dr. Eugene Spafford. He's a professor of computer science at Purdue University, where he's served on the faculty since 1987. Um, which actually is before I got into the cybersecurity field in 1992. So um, uh, he's definitely seen this field grow up, uh, as it were. Additionally, uh, among many things uh, over his career, Spaff, as his friends, colleagues, and uh, the community refer to him, he's the Executive Director Emeritus of the Purdue Sirius Center, which is the Center for Education and Research and Information Assurance and Security, and was the founder and director of the now superseded Coast Laboratory. Uh, he's editor-in-chief of Elsevier's Journal of Computers and Security, which is the oldest journal in the field of information security. Spaff himself is a student and a researcher in computing for over 40 years, 35 of which have been in security-related areas. At the moment, his current research interests are primarily in the areas of information security generally, computer crime investigation, and information ethics. Spaff's been on a number of advisory and editorial boards over his career, and he's generally recognized as one of the senior leaders in the field of computing. I dare say most of us on this talk have been informed or enlightened by some aspect of his work over the years. Uh, we welcome Spaff to UMBC to offer his sage thoughts, his wit, his wisdom about cybersecurity past and present, and what it bodes for the future. Speaking for myself, I think it'll mean job security for folks in our discipline, but I'll let Spaff have the final word on that. So with that, Spaff, over to you, and welcome to UMBC. Uh, thank you, and I wish I was there personally, and hope I'll get a chance to visit in person sometime uh, before too long. Uh, I do not have slides. I don't use these too often when I speak. I'm going to talk from notes because that gives me an opportunity to uh, riff a little bit on different things and, and some topics that don't fit neatly into an illustration. So this is entitled Cyber Lessons Learned and Unlearned. And what I want to do is share with you some observations based on my experience that I have uh, been thinking about over the, the last few months in particular. But let me start by giving you some context. Um, my first program that I wrote was 50 years ago in Fortran 2. And in that same year, I also uh, made a program, I won't say written, but using plug boards for an IBM calculator. Uh, if you don't know what a plug board is, consider yourself lucky. Uh, early computers didn't use text languages, they used wires. And so my time in computing is half a century, which is kind of a scary thought. Um, I took a winding path to get to the PhD. It wasn't direct. So any of you who are students who are thinking about that, uh, don't necessarily bemoan your progress because uh, you, if you learn things along the way, it may be valuable uh, down the road. But I ended up doing my uh, PhD in distributed operating systems, reliable operating systems at Georgia Tech, and then did a postdoc in uh, software engineering before I went to Purdue. But I always had a kind of a hobbyist interest in cybersecurity, although at the time that I did my PhD, cybersecurity really meant doing uh, cryptography or formal verification of systems. And I wasn't really interested in either of those at the time. During my career, so going from 50 years ago forward to today, 
uh, I recently did a blog post. I totaled up. I've written non-trivial programs in at least 60 different programming languages. That's somewhat unusual for people in the field this day uh, today because uh, we sort of concentrate on maybe three or four languages or languages that are very similar to each other. Uh, but I, I believe that using all those languages gave me some new insights. I've also used at least eight different operating systems, and that doesn't include variations of Linux. Uh, I've built two operating systems, and I've built three compilers, uh, one of those in assembly language. So I've also written some large, large projects. Now, admittedly, those are a uh, little little less complicated than the ones that people use now. Uh, the One of the compilers, the one I did in assembly language, was written for the Pascal language. But there's a lot of insight there to be gained. And what I would say is that that experience, as I look back on it, for maybe the first half of my career, I was in a position where I understood how a computing system worked all the way from the circuit to the user interface. I had studied those, I had written some of them, I'd used them, patched them. And so when something happened in a system, I actually had a good idea of what was happening. That helped a lot in my security work, in my software engineering work, and still does to this day. But I think we've gotten to the point now where no one person can comprehend everything that's going on from the hardware level to the user interface because we have developed specializations and there are things that we kind of gloss over now in a typical degree and it takes so much time to learn some of those things. We have some people who are expert in parts of that stack but uh, as I've given talks and talked to people I haven't found many who have entered the field in the last, let's say, 15 years, who've put in the time to study to learn really uh, the whole stack from uh, hardware to uh, user wear. And that, I think, is part of the problem that we have currently with security, because we have people working on parts of the system and don't understand how it all fits together. Classic software engineering studies for errors showed that uh, a significant percentage of the errors, sometimes the majority of errors, occur at the interfaces. And we have multiple interfaces in a system, uh, certainly from the hardware to the operating system, the operating system to applications, applications to the network, uh, applications to the user, applications to databases, applications, uh, interfaces to other uh, systems. So all of these combined present opportunities for flaws, misconfigurations, and attack surfaces. And they're not all uh, necessarily in the mental model of the, the people who are trying to protect those or run them. So let me outline a few of what I see as big problems that I've identified during my time in working in security, uh, which has really been about 35 years in various aspects of this. And this has been not only just academic work, but I have been part of efforts in uh, corporate America and in government agencies to uh, analyze and improve security. So the first thing, and really a fundamental thing, is what is security? And I would contend that we don't know how to define security in a meaningful way. If you were to ask 50 people who said that they worked in cybersecurity, which is not a great term, but it's the one we're using, uh, you would probably get close to 50 different definitions. Because even if you look in uh, well-known textbooks or papers, there isn't a good definition of what security in cyber sense really is. You can find things that talk about characteristics of a secure system, but 
there isn't something that really carefully defines what it is. Uh, that's in part because the security is dependent a lot on context. It depends on the policy of the organization running the systems or the users who are employing the systems. It depends on the threats that are currently available and are directed towards the system. It's even sometimes just a matter of timing. Uh, some systems that may have been proof against any kinds of external threats in one year, in a later year, suddenly are, are wide open and vulnerable because of uh, discovery of problems in supply chain or flaws in the software, or simply because the organization running the system has become more of a target. So security is contextual in both uh, application and in time. One of the uh, real pioneers in the, in the field of security, Robert Courtney, uh, whose name few people recognize, uh, Bob was uh, the original uh, system security architect for IBM. Uh, he articulated some, some truisms of security in his three laws, and I think they were really quite astute. The first is that nothing useful can be said about the security of a mechanism except in the context of a specific application and environment, which is basically what I just said. Uh, but this was recognized when he first stated this about 30 years ago. The second thing he stated, which is also important, uh, is never spend more mitigating a risk than tolerating it will cost you. This is a matter of basic economics and risk management. If something will just cost you an hour of time to restore from a backup, then you shouldn't be spending $3 million to prevent the system from going down, uh, unless you value your hour uh, more at the rates that some law firms do. Uh, that really security is an economic exercise where you balance risks versus protections. Um, and third, and this is also quite astute, there are management solutions to technical problems but no technical solutions to management problems. And this captures the human aspect of security, is that we can't build software, algorithms, or hardware. They're going to remove every possible mistake and threat from human beings. We have to have a balanced approach that looks at people and the social constructs, as well as the computing systems. When I started Sirius at Purdue uh, in uh, two, 1999, um, this was a, a sort of a novel concept, but it was based on the idea that we had to include the human sciences, social sciences, uh, and, and systems as part of the computing systems in coming up with solutions. And the way I phrased it at the time, which is sort of a corollary to Courtney, is that uh, if we had no computers, we'd have no computer crime. But if we had no people, we'd have no computer crime. We have to address the totality of the experience. And that really goes to the heart of something about defining what security is. We can't define it only for the computer because we have to consider the people who are involved. We have to understand the environmental issues that are involved because there may be environmental factors that lead to flaws, such as uh, solar flare, for instance, could cause uh, flips of bits in memory that could change the behavior of the systems. And we wouldn't necessarily note it uh, until afterwards that that occurred. Uh, this leads me to think that maybe defining security isn't the appropriate way for us to go. Perhaps what we really need to do is define something similar to safety. So that we talk about a system not necessarily being secure, but not doing something that is going to cause a loss or cause danger. There's a difference there, if you know, where we're talking about the outcomes, which can include people and environment, rather than characteristics of the system itself. This means as well that we are going to have to capture all the various specifications of how that system is supposed to behave. 
um, all the things it can do and can't do. Because if we're going to define an envelope of safety or uh, resilience or security, we need to know what is allowed and what isn't. Again, another another pioneer in the field, Earl Bobert, um, once wrote that uh, a system that is not specified is never incorrect. It's only surprising. And that's where most of our systems are today. Few of our systems are fully specified. So when something goes wrong and we say that there's a security flaw, what really has happened is we've gotten a surprise because there wasn't any guarantee that the system was going to behave in a certain way. It was never specified as not having that particular behavior. In fact, if you look at most of the software you get, uh, whether it's uh, FOSS, uh, free and open source software, or whether it's uh, commercial software, and you look at the readme file and the license file, it doesn't promise anything. It doesn't say anything about loss. And in fact, the commercial ones absolve them of all the losses and misbehavior and explicitly tell you not to use it in a safety critical environment because they can't say for sure what it's going to do and their lawyers won't let them try. So we're in a position right now where we really can't define security very well. We have sort of working definitions of things we don't want systems to do, uh, but that isn't really deserving of uh, some of the effort we put into this, both from a science standpoint and engineering. But let's go on from that, because I won't say that we can, we can do that perfectly. Uh, what we can do is uh, what uh, generally the field has moved on to doing, which is to talk about assurance and assured systems. And basically this is doing things that give us additional confidence, additional assurance that the software and systems are going to behave roughly as we want them to. Okay, uh, that's, that's a, a mechanism that we can possibly build on. And if we have enough assurance, then we can get a system that's trusted or at least trusted within the context that we want to use it. But how do we build those systems? Well, now we're back at another problem is we don't build software very well. We don't know how to build reliable software consistently. Uh, it's, it's a major problem and it's made worse by the fact that the mechanisms that we know of that are there to build more reliable systems are generally avoided by designers and programmers. What are some of those mechanisms? Well, uh, for instance, using uh, strongly typed languages, uh, using preconditions and postconditions, formal verification, formal requirements capture, specification testing. These are all things that could be done that have been shown to help reduce, uh, produce more reliable software, but we generally don't do them. And it's rare that you find a program where those are actually required of students as part of the programming curriculum or the software engineering curriculum. We don't, we don't do a good job of using the best mechanisms we know and teaching it to people. And there are a number of reasons there uh, why that's not uh, the case. One is that uh, it takes time to teach those and not everybody can learn them. Although programming is fairly easy to learn, we can teach that. And in the field, there's a tremendous shortage of people to write software. So that's kind of where we go. We have programs all across the country, uh, many of which are certified through organizations like ABET that do a wonderful job of teaching basics of computing, but really in the area of software engineering, it's kind of basic. Um, and those people then go on and build the systems that we all use. Many years ago, when the government was uh, in the market for buying trusted, reliable software, back in the days of the Rainbow Series, and some of you know what that is, and others, uh, you, can, you can look it up, uh, got sort of sidetracked by formal verification, 
with the sense that they would only accept for some applications systems that have been formally verified. And the problem there is that generally uh, verification of every system is out of reach. We can only verify some systems because of timing and cost and some other issues. But it all comes around to the area of it's expensive to build reliable software. We don't have enough people. We don't have the tools generally available. And we don't have the common body of practice to build reliable software. That adds to the problem because we are continuing to build a huge legacy base of code that isn't completely reliable, has been built by people of varying capabilities, and it's out there and it gets reused. In some cases, we depend on it. And when that code gets reused, we are incorporating potential flaws and limitations that we don't know about because we don't go back and look at it. So that's you know, my second concern, in addition to not being able to define security, we don't know how to build reliable software in a consistent way and to build up a corpus of it that we can continue to use. So what do we do? Well, we use that. We build software and it works most of the time. But then we have a marketplace issue. It is expensive to build new systems, to put the effort in, to get everything up and running. It doesn't happen all that often. Uh, we have some things that go from an academic environment, a research environment, out into more mainstream use, but it's rare. And for vendors, particularly established vendors, they have a need to continue their revenue stream. They don't want to build a system, market it, and then not have people come back because that's a limited revenue stream. So we have built a model in software where basically for commercial software, we continue to have releases of versioning of software where the software is issued with new features, new versions, in part to take advantage of new hardware, but also to drive new revenue as new licensing occurs. That means that there's an issue of how long does it take to develop to keep that revenue stream active. Uh, and so we have this time to market issue. When we have new applications or new features where there's competition, uh, the competition is for who gets to market first to gain share rather than who gets to market best. Because the consumers want the new shiny features, want to be able to play the new cat videos rather than have something that they can trust and that's really reliable in most cases. I mean, most customers aren't really looking for that. They're looking for cheapest and fastest. So the marketplace is also sort of stacked against us. We've developed this habit, this custom of revisions, even of free and open source software, rather than producing something that is fit for purpose and doesn't need to be altered because it doesn't have any flaws to the best of our ability to tell. We instead add new features, add backwards compatibility, and issue the uh, revisions on a fairly regular basis because uh, we want new features, we want it to run new places, or we need to expand our revenue stream. This has led to something that uh, uh, Richard Donsick uh, and talking to him, he described it as a Ptolemaic view of computing. Uh, Ptolemy, Ptolemy was the um, philosopher scientist who put forth the view that uh, the sun and planets revolved around the earth. And this held for a very long time. But every time there was an observation that something didn't quite fit that model, people who held to that model would adjust. They would come up with an explanation or a reason why uh, the observations didn't match. And the model continued for about uh, 1,200 years. So had a good long life. Copernicus came along, however, and said, hey, here's another model. And it explains everything much better. 
And that's where everything revolves around the sun. Copernicus was not acclaimed necessarily for this view because it was contrary to what everybody had believed for a millennia. Uh, he was branded as a heretic and people uh, um, didn't adopt his views. Uh, they were trashed by, by other experts until eventually the benefits of the model came to be realized. Well, in talking about this with, with uh, uh, Dr. Donzig, the idea is that we have this model that's worked. It's the Copernican view of issuing regular releases and then patching when we discover things that are wrong. And it seems to keep everything moving along and working, but the flaws are becoming ever more obvious. The patches can't get out fast enough and certainly not faster than the attackers. For anybody who's studied um, any of the sort of attack response uh, literature, you run across something called the OODA loop that uh, Colonel John Boyd developed, um, originally taught for military aviators, but it fits a lot of other places. And it's basically the observe, orient, decide, and act loop. And the idea is that in any engagement, if you can execute your loop faster than your opponent, or slow your opponents down, then you win. Because you can make more moves in faster uh, in a shorter time than your opponent and you can outmaneuver them. That's what's happening to us repeatedly now in the software field. The flaws, the attacks, the malware, the supply chain attacks are coming faster than we can apply the patches and the defenses and we're losing out. So a question here um, that we had in this discussion when it, when it occurred is how long do we stick to the Ptolemaic view of computing, the, the current view, rather than switching to something that works a little bit better? Well, the answer to that is it may be a while. And this is the fourth problem that I've seen over the long term in security is most people and most applications want cheaper rather than safer because many of the risks are hard to, con to conceptualize. So your average person can't really understand exactly uh, what some penetration of a database held by a vendor is going to do to them or uh, what malware, how it behaves or what it's going to do to their system. Um, and it's a lot simpler to define cost than reliability. Cost involves something close to tangible that everybody can uh, measure. We can look at how many dollars we have uh, to spend or to save, but reliability, well, because we can't define security well, we don't have good measures. As a result, uh, we are compelled very often to take a cheaper path a less expensive path than a safer one. A wonderful example is the burgeoning field of Internet of Things. We have, uh, well, you know, flying drones. We have household appliances like dishwashers and refrigerators. We have self-driving uh, automobiles. We have a number of, of these things that are coming out as part of the Internet of Things, and an awful lot of them are being based on a version of Linux or a version of Android or a version of Windows because those are cheap and there's a huge body of legacy software to go with them. Not because they're necessarily the best fit for the purpose, not because they are the most reliable, it's because they're available and they don't cost much. This leads to, as well, a mindset that those software platforms that we're using need to have more features so that they are available to run on any platform. And that's somewhat ridiculous. Um, we should have a different feature set between what we want to run on our dishwasher and what we want powering weapons control on board uh, an aircraft carrier. And yet, we may be using the same underlying operating system on both. With all of the interfaces, complexity, 
and flaws that are present. This assumption of standardized platforms, cheap as possible uh, deployment, uh, saving cost, and using the legacy means that we expand our attack surface ever larger and gives us a real problem in being able to uh, gain any assurance that our system is going to work properly. So what does that lead to? Well, that leads to the fifth problem, or maybe it's the sixth here, uh, problem in, in my list that I've observed, which is we have an awful lot of people in business and in the field right now who believe that this idea of penetrate and patch is the way to get security. That if we red team and find flaws, that somehow is going to ensure security. That if we use systems where there are quick patches for attacks, that that's somehow more secure uh, than building a system right the first time. This goes back to the problem of defining security uh, in the first place. But it, it also really skews the idea a lot. If someone breaks into my system, it doesn't matter if I can patch it tomorrow or three days from now because the penetration has occurred. Whatever theft or tampering or other misbehavior is going to occur has occurred. And therefore, we can't say a system is more secure because I can patch it more quickly. We can't say that a system is secure because if I deploy a red team, they can break into it. Instead, what we need to do is we need to have systems where that isn't a concern. Another aspect of this uh, penetrate in patches, after a certain amount of time, we decide to virtualize. We put a wrapper around things. So we have containers on virtual machines in cloud server uh, farms. Each is adding yet another layer of protection to try to reduce the number of attacks and penetrations that occur but each is adding to the complexity of the systems and taking it further away from our understanding of how to secure them. A lot of this mindset, if we relate this back to software engineering, is, is sort of similar to black box testing. Rather than understanding what's inside the box and building it and testing it accordingly, we throw things at it randomly. If you study the literature of software testing, black box testing, where you randomly generate test cases is about the worst kind of testing to actually detect flaws. But we're largely depending on that with our, our red teaming, our penetration and testing uh, and patching uh, uh, systems that we use now. So those are high level observations of why I think we are really in a difficult situation right now as, as regards talking about security. Um, let me make a few observations about things that I've seen that that work going forward and that might be worth bearing in mind. So the first is we need to work towards better metrics. Any metrics are very often better than none at all. So even if all we do is come up with some rough metrics of risk, those can be used to communicate to decision makers and those who spend the money, whether or not certain things should be deployed and what kind of resources should be deployed to fix them. I would guess that um, probably only one out of 20 uh, programs that teach cybersecurity actually spend any significant time on teaching risk analysis. Uh, I wanted to include that in one of our security courses and was overruled by the faculty because they felt web security uh, needed to be talked about as something more important. Um, which is kind of frustrating for, for my own program. But looking out at all, I, I would suggest that this is something that any of us who are working in, in cybersecurity need to do to develop better measurement models, better metrics, and be sure that we understand the ones that are available to us because we're going to have to communicate those with decision makers. A second thing that we can do is start realizing that one size doesn't fit all. There is not one true programming language. There is not one best operating system or one best database system 
or one best browser or anything else that you want to name. What we should be doing is looking at what's needed to perform the best fit with the least exposure to additional flaws and problems. Is it actually going to be um, using a tailored version of Linux, for instance, or Android? Is there something in the market that works better? Uh, for instance, there is a commercial product called the Integrity Operating System. Uh, I suspect that few people have heard of that. It's on the market today. It's marketed by a company called Green Hills uh, Software. It is a real-time, formally verified kernel. It won't allow you to go out and browse the web. Well, actually, I take that back. There is an extension that allows you to browse a web, but not generally speaking, go out to the web at large. And you're not going to be able to run Word and Excel on it. But it does offer guarantees against penetration and subversion. And it is used in aerospace and nuclear power, among other places, thankfully, because those are high consequence, high loss environments. And the designers who work in those environments uh, have heard about it. Question is, how many people have heard about it outside of those realms? How many people have heard about other operating systems that might be good to use that have a different feature set, but are more suited for the use at hand? Same thing with languages, uh, for instance, the fact that one language has a free compiler that you can download does not necessarily make it the best language to use to write a large legacy system. And it goes on, but I'll move to the next point, which is we need to accept that building things of quality and reliability with safety in mind is going to cost more. And we have to be willing to accept the cost in time and in dollars to pay for resources. Until we value real security and privacy, we're not likely to get it. Certainly not on purpose. It uh, potentially uh, an accident in some cases. Uh, but we have to understand, as in almost anywhere else, uh, that we are going to build something, engineering something of quality. It costs more for materials, trained personnel, time to design and test. We need to get in that mindset with the security. We also need to hold bad products and the vendors who put them out accountable. When something is rushed to market with obvious flaws, we should speak up about it. There was a, a NPR did an interesting coverage on the solar winds uh, penetration. And one of the comments that was made in that is that the company solar winds going over their processes identified 11 areas where they could improve security as a result of of uh, the penetration. Well, the question was posed, was that, was that 11 things that needed to be patched? Or was that a case where there were 11 weaknesses that were there for a long time? I think that's an interesting question. It's a duality that we don't often think of. If we look at something and we find some obvious flaws, the question is, why were they there? Rather than, OK, good, we fixed it. It should be, why is it there? Who's responsible? How could that have been avoided in the first place? And then as kind of a last thought, uh, we don't do a good job when we talk about security of including privacy. We certainly see it. We see the IEEE Symposium on Security and Privacy. And we talk about security and privacy, but we don't really embrace privacy in the US at least the way it's embraced in, for instance, Europe. Privacy is very often the driver of security. People want their system secure to protect their privacy. That means we should also be designing with privacy in mind and using it as a lever to produce more secure products. Um, if we're gonna work in the field, we need to actually change our view that instead of producing things that are correct, with maybe a flaw or two, we should be understanding that from the very beginning, 
that whatever we produce as an engineered artifact is likely to have flaws. And we should be trying to identify those flaws, build in recovery mechanisms, safety mechanisms to protect privacy and protect reliability of those systems, rather than putting that burden on the consumers so that when the system breaks, they have to install the patches. As Rick said at the beginning, um, this is a field where I don't think any of you are going to suffer from employment possibilities in the future. These are problems that are endemic and are going to take a long time to fix. And I hope you will be part of the solution rather than part of the problem. So I'll open it up to questions at this point. Thanks very much, Staff. Um, yeah, hearing a lot of what you were talking about, I mean, it echoes a lot of what I've you know said at conferences over the years as well. Um, and I, I, looking back, I would have started off your talk with simply raising my hands and saying, we're all doomed because everything you've mentioned comes back. It starts with and ends up with the human factor and the people, you know, we're, we're designing the software, we're des developing the systems and the architectures, we're implementing them and, you know, using them, configuring them or bre and breaking into them, but it all comes back to people. Like you said, so I was really, really glad to see you you know, kind of kick off your talk with that emphasis, because I think really that underpins a lot of the follow-on problems that you uh, you described. So that was, um, I, I think it was brilliant. So thank you for that. A as a reminder to people, uh, <laughs> please feel free to raise your hand, or if you have a question, you can type it in the chat box and I will relay it on air to um, to SPAF. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll add here while we're waiting for something to come up. Um, as a society, pretty much everything around us uh, is built as an engineering output, whether it's planes or bridges or tall buildings or automobiles. And they don't fail on a regular basis because we've learned over time how to anticipate some of the problems and build in safety. But we don't build in safety against every possible failure uh, as a matter of cost, as a matter of materials. Exactly. We, we have to learn to do that with our software artifacts as well. And we, we just haven't gotten there yet as a field. And that's partly because we've we built up bad practice and, and partly simply the, the youth of the field. Um, really, if you look back, we haven't been building software that long. So there's a lot yet for us to learn as a field, but we've got to we've got to embrace it. I agree. Uh, we have a question here from uh, Aaron Massey. Aaron, go ahead. Aaron, you can unmute yourself. Sorry about that. Yep. Uh, I love the talks, Beth. Always, always good to hear you talk about security and software engineering in tandem because uh, I very much agree with that mindset. And I wanted to ask a question actually kind of related to the point that you made early on and also just now that you, the software engineering process is critical to ensuring that we build safe, reliable systems we can depend on. Uh, and I'll ask it in kind of a, a hyperbolic fashion. If you had a billion dollars and you had to allocate it into one of two buckets, either working towards new tools and techniques for building from scratch new software systems or on tools and techniques for evaluating and correcting current existing insecure systems, which of those two buckets would you put the money into? I'd probably put about three quarters of it into the evaluation and fixing of current uh, for the simple reason that we have so many deployments and applications where we can't fundamentally re-engineer them, or we can, but the, the expense would be way too high. But if we were able to identify, circumvent, or fix many of the problems with them, we would have a better return on investment and reduction in risk. But I wouldn't put all my money there because we are constantly evolving and building newer things. Uh, and so that's why I'd probably do about three quarters to fixing and one quarter towards, towards new development methods. Thanks. I, I kind of feel like it's more 50 50 for me and I'll, I'll give you my rationale and see if you'll respond to it briefly. Um, 
the point that you made about not knowing how to build software systems makes it really hard to evaluate software systems, or at least to evaluate them fairly, especially kind of looking at the, the point that you were making about solar winds, where it's not just finding the particular flaw, but also finding the, the problems in the process that led to the flaw. And unless we know how to build software systems in a safe, reliable fashion, which we don't, um, it's hard to know how to find those errors of process rather than simple errors of implementation. Yeah, um, part of this, I think, though, is is simply being aware of the number of of systems and the the total cost of systems out there. Um, you know, my my ratio may be wrong, yours may be right, but um, I I think, given that in some countries uh, there are more basically personal computers than there are people. And, and realize that a personal computer is, is not what I grew up with. A personal computer is a cell phone, but it's a lot more than a phone. And, and the number of those that are available um, is, is just mind boggling. And so being able to fix those may have higher payoff uh, than investing in the next generation of them. But I don't have a billion dollars. Uh, that's, that's why I haven't retired yet. <laughs> well, you also know that I didn't, uh, I didn't include any whiskey or scotch option in that. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> that allocation. Hey, thanks, thanks, for, thanks for right there. Thank you, Aaron. Um, question from uh, Ennis, one of our uh, Cyber Defense Lab students. How can we specify security correctly when dealing with nebulous adversaries possessing potentially unknown resources, skills, knowledge, and so on? It's a good question, and it's it's one that um, giving a complete answer would take a very long time here. But part of the issue, and this is why I said maybe thinking safety is better than security, because if something goes wrong with my system, I may not be able to tell whether it is a flaw in the code, a hardware fault, or an attacker. Uh, I have to do deep forensics to be able to tell the difference. What I am able to discern is what are the effects? I'm able to see did was information exposed? Was critical processing interrupted? Was an incorrect value returned? If I have specifications of how the program is supposed to behave, the software, the system, whatever it is, and, and there are methods of capturing those specifications and the requirements that go that underlie them then I can build the system with self-checks, safeguards, and recovery mechanisms against those flaws. And in so doing, I am also providing some of the protection and also being able to think about ways of protecting the system. So that's part of the equation. The other is properly thinking through attack methodologies, weaknesses, architecture, and, and this is where a longer discussion comes in, we aren't able to anticipate all possible flaws. Um, for instance, it may in fact be the case that a UFO lands and the aliens are telepathic and are able to pick up your passwords right away. Two-factor authentication might work against that, um, but it's not a threat that we've anticipated per se. Uh, but we, But if we have thought about somebody capturing our password some way, Two factor is something that comes up. So if we think about consequence rather than mechanism and adversary, uh, that is one way that we can we can uh, shorten that uh, um, cycle. Thanks. As a reminder, if you have questions, please uh, feel free to uh, put them in the chat box or raise your hand. Um, I have a comment here from uh, Gary. For the near term and likely further, the trustworthiness of our systems is low, low assurance software. Therefore, perhaps the key to business submission success is wise use, depending on the software only to the degree it is dependable. And having to do so can be a driver for time and money to build trustworthy software. In theory, that's the way it should work. Uh, what we've seen so far is that few businesses have been penalized for just taking the low road and letting things get uh, broken into or, or stolen. 
the market has not penalized organizations on that yet. Uh, the government has been loath to get into that uh, as well, uh, levying penalties, at least the U.S. government. So it might be a path for the future, but part of that, too, is educating the population um, to be discriminating about the fact that some vendors are better than others. Uh, the Apple Expo is going on at the same time, and supposedly they're releasing their new privacy disclosure rules which are going to impact, for instance, Facebook very badly because Facebook Facebook really has no respect for privacy. Um, and, and we'll see if that makes a difference in the number of people subscribing to Facebook, for instance, as a, as a business uh, kind of usage. So uh, I, I think you're right in principle, but I, I, I don't think in practice we've gotten to that point yet in the market. Um, I have a question about safe programming language. Um, I've been programming for 60 years. I've got over a million lines of source code on my file at UMBC that I've written. Uh, the biggest language because of history is Fortran. My safest language today I consider to be Java. What do you consider to be the safest programming language? Um. Well, my, my flippant answer to that would be malbloge because nobody can program in it. Um, I, I, part of it depends on what the, the language is supposed to do. Um, and and uh, so Java has some advantages, but for speed, it's not particularly good. For some concurrent programming, it's not particularly good. Um, things like Rust and Swift are are uh, languages that that get into this arena. Uh, Python uh, has advantages to it. So again, I, I don't think there's a single answer. I think it it's looking at the environment where it's supposed to run and the characteristics of uh, how it's supposed to behave. Uh, there is development for for newer language. Swift and Rust are examples of newer languages that have been developed specifically to take advantage of particular environments and provide some security, better security. Um, so, so yeah, I, I, that's the best I can answer your question. All right. Uh, let's see. We've got a question here from, uh, Tim Finan. Disseminating misinformation is now seen as a kind of security issue for society. Have we seen misinformation being disseminated through open source cyber threat information like stick or MSIP? I'm unaware of. Uh, that occurring. Um, there have been uh, not not disinformation, but there have been threats that have been posted in patches and alerts. Um, there have also been some stories that have been circulated that have been debunked fairly short or quickly thereafter that maligned certain vendors. Um, so that may be disinformation in this regard. Uh, but I don't think I've seen anything that in the form that you outlined there. Okay. You skipped a couple there, Rick. Yeah, I'm going to back up. Um, from Andrew, uh, what does an ideal cyber curriculum look like for undergraduates? And, and what type of career would that ideal curriculum support? Wow. Um, I'm, I'm not sure I can, I can completely answer that. Um, in part, it's, a, it's sort of the difference between a cyber science versus cyber engineering um, tilt to the education. Um, here at Purdue, we have three computing majors that sort of exemplify the, the uh, well, actually, we've got more than three, but uh, I'll limit to the, to the three main ones. We have computer science, where we teach basically issues of what can be computed um, and how efficiently and how to extend that. So well, that, that's theory, uh, operating systems, languages, databases, networks, and so on. 
we have a computer engineering degree, which is how do you build new applications? How do you build new systems um, and do so with engineering constraints? And then we have a polytechnic uh, where a technology program where people are taught how to use the tools to solve problems. All three produce individuals who are able to go out and be employed, but they're all taught very different things. If you look at something like NIS, NICE um, uh, breakdown of skill sets in the area, there are about, I think it's currently up to close to 50 different career paths or, or job classifications that doesn't cover everything in the field and they're disjoint in many respects. So an ideal cyber curriculum for an undergraduate might run about eight years if you were going to include all that. Um, we are at the point where we need to better define tracks through those. And, and I think that's what we're, uh, what we're headed for here. Um, going back to one of the earlier questions, uh, Josiah kind of reframed the first question a little differently. If you had a, a dollar to spend on anything in cybersecurity, how would you spend it? Maybe he meant to say a billion. No, I, I think he, he was sort of responding to um, to Aaron's question. Yeah. Um, right, a dollar, uh, where would I put it? Well, um, I, I would probably donate that to something like um, uh, Epic or uh, Women Who Code or uh, some organization that is working to get people better educated and, and more available in the profession. If I had $10, I would, I would put uh, maybe half there and see if there's a fund out there that I could contribute to that uh, is looking to uh, create changes in legislation and liability and software law. Uh, you know, that's another thing I, I didn't address here in the talk, but uh, when we talk about not having enough people in the field, we also have a somewhat skewed view of what the field is because of the representation, we, we really have a number of underrepresented groups, traditionally underrepresented groups that are not reflected in an equal quantity in our programs, um, women included. Um, there, there's a wonderful film available right now through PBS. You can look for it, it's called Coded Bias. Yes, um, yes. And we showed it here I, actually. Excellent. Yeah, if you haven't seen it, I'd recommend it. Uh, this is another thing in security. If we had a, a broader set of perspectives, that might help as well. Um, so, yeah, that's off on a tangent from what you asked, but hopefully I answered your question. Uh, next, we're going to go to um, Michael. Uh, I see your hand up. You've been patient. Uh, go ahead with your question. Hi, my name is Michal. Um, Michal, sorry. That's all right. I get Michael all the time. So the last for the last year, I've been a teaching assistant for an introductory programming class. And these students, they're they're learning Python, and then they realize they have to learn C plus plus, and they're like, ah, oh, why can't there be one language for everything? Like, why can't we just put like a mass Swiss Army knife, all of the memory handling, object oriented, you know, everything that is good about Python and C and everything into just one language um so theoretically if such if such a super language could exist and it was useful and it was safe and maybe uh going on this tangent so an operating system that was actually good that like true swiss army knife what would you think of that um so i'll give you two answers one one sort of flippant is that we had that language it was called ada um, and uh, it didn't it didn't get very widely adopted for a number of reasons. But um, imagine a Swiss Army knife that has got fifty or a hundred blades on it. Uh, you can you can get one. I've got one on my shelf. I can even show you here. It was given to me as a gift. You could possibly build a house using one of those, but it would be very slow. The quality wouldn't be very good. And you would probably cut yourself multiple times. 
that's the problem with trying to pack everything into a one-size-fits-all solution is it does everything but maybe it doesn't do anything well and you have a lot of extra stuff including things that you don't use very often that when you finally do need to use it you're not sure how it's used um, and and there have been a number of studies shown that people using complex languages um, understand some core features well don't understand some of the other outlying aspects so I, I think that it gets back to the idea of using the right tool for the right problem that when you have a, a one-size-fits-all um, it doesn't necessarily do everything well and it exposes you to a greater likelihood of making mistakes on the parts you don't know well so I hope that answers what you were asking yeah it does exactly thank you very much Okay, hey, uh, we're just crossing uh, two o'clock. I have uh, another question in the uh, in the chat room. I'd like to make a, a last call for any questions. Please raise your hand or put it in the chat box. This is from Ryan. I've seen the Federal Reserve researching digital currency with MIT. It's some speculation it could be Algorand or something similar as it came out of MIT. China is also developing a digital one, uh, and I'll add even the Bank of England is looking into creating a digital currency over in Great Britain. How do you think the adoption will influence cyber crimes? Will it be easier to track or make crime more hidden, given that malware often requests payout in Bitcoin? Uh, part of it is the way the digital currency is designed. Um, it's the total anonymity that makes current digital currencies, some of them, very attractive for uh, cyber criminals. And the designs, for instance, the design of the Chinese system doesn't give you that anonymity. It, it just takes away the physical presence of the currency and, in fact, gives the state control over whether you can get your money. So um, it's a design I issue rather than something fundamental to a digital currency. We, have, we effectively have digital currency now where you can do online banking and credit cards. That's all digital. Uh, yeah, you've got a, a plastic card that you initially get, but you use that number and from then on it's all digital. But it's not anonymous. And that is that is really the issue, is, is what design you have in there for tracking and control. Exactly. So. Uh, Gary has a closing thought. Uh, he's over at uh, John Sopper's Applied Physics Lab. Yep. Uh, I'm just going to summarize. Um, his, as a red teamer here at APL uh, put it, we can be in the situation of moving from woefully inadequate to not good enough and not know it. Um, so he's kind of tying back to your earlier comments, you know, about shifting from security to assur mission assurance as a mindset. Uh, and then kind of developing our philosophy around that approach. So um, I agree, Gary. I think that's uh, that, that's a useful evolution and a useful useful way of thinking. Are there any final questions um, from the audience? I know uh, some folks have, have had to leave early to go teach, but uh, make a last call for any uh, any any questions or comments. Well, thank you all for listening. I very much appreciate it, and I do hope to get a chance to visit in person sometime in the near future. And thank you. Yeah, thank, thank, thank you, Spaff. Uh, everybody, please uh, join me in uh, thanking uh, Spaff for spending part of his day with us. I, we appreciate it, and um, hopefully we'll be able to uh, link up in person sometime soon. So, uh, Spaff, thank you for, uh, for your time today, and I'll certainly catch you offline. Bye-bye. Take care.